Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Joey English. I'm a stroke neurologist and neurointerventional surgeon uh, based in San Francisco. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here today and, and speak to this audience. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Dunlap, Dr. Uh, Bierbaum, uh, for in the program committee for inviting me to speak here. Uh, so we're going to talk about the really remarkable revolution that's happened over the last few years uh, regarding the endovascular treatment of acute ischemic stroke, uh, and in particular, uh, what are called large vessel occlusions. Uh, and as I'll show in a moment, you know, there are very few hospitals currently in Northern California that can provide this type of intervention for stroke patients. And that necessitates at this time that the transfer of, of many patients from facilities uh, where they may arrive initially uh, to a facility like mine that can provide that therapy. And so in doing so over the last four years, we obviously have, have come to work closely with many different hospitals throughout Northern California. And you quickly learn that the success of the local program uh, has everything to do with the champions of that program at that facility. Uh, and I think Santa Rosa Memorial in particular should be proud that they have Dr. Luton uh, as the stroke uh, director, as well as Lee Rink, who I think may be here as the, uh, there she is, as their stroke coordinator. These folks are just two of the most tireless uh, champions for stroke patients I've met. Uh, and it's been a privilege to, to work with them and, and all of the staff at Santa Rosa Memorial. So we're gonna to speak today about endovascular treatment uh, of stroke. These are my disclosures. I have done consulting work with two biotech companies, uh, Stryker and Covidian, that make the two devices that are approved in the United States for this treatment uh, and trying to help build better devices, if you will. So you should know that disclosure. So Dr. Luton did an excellent job of giving an overview of stroke, uh, in, uh, and I'm gonna focus fairly narrowly on what are called large vessel occlusion. So as he mentioned, when someone has a stroke, as a stroke neurologist, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out why did this stroke happen so that we can try to prevent this from ever happening again. Was this from atrial fibrillation? Was it from cervical carotid disease? Maybe a paradoxical embolus from a patent foramen ovale? Various things. That's important for secondary prevention. In the acute phase, of what, if we want to know, is this patient a potential candidate for an endovascular therapy? The source of the stroke is not as important as the type of stroke. And so we break down ischemic stroke into two basic categories, what we call large vessel occlusions and small vessel occlusions. So large vessel occlusions typically are embolic in nature, meaning that there's a blood clot that comes from some proximal source, the most common clearly being atrial fibrillation, where that clot dislodges and goes up to the intracranial circulation. Uh, and occludes uh, typically one of the large vessels at the base of the, of the brain, in this case, the so-called middle cerebral artery. Cervical carotid disease is probably the second leading cause of, of thromboembolic disease to the intracranial circulation, again, with a clot embolizing upstairs to the intracranial circulation. Now, the key point here, and I'll come back to this when we talk about the systems of care that we have created to try to improve blood flow in these patients, and as a general rule, the intracranial circulation is normal. The blood vessel there is normal, uh, minding its own business, when a blood clot came from elsewhere to block it off. So our treatments have actually been very different from the types of treatment that our interventional cardiology colleagues have developed, where they're dealing with a really diseased blood vessel, a coronary vessel that has lots of atherosclerotic plaque, progressive stenosis, narrowing plaque rupture, acute thrombosis. So the notion of using balloon-mounted stents to open up a very, very diseased blood vessel in the heart and then using the stent to maintain its patency is very different from the type of disease that we treat where usually the blood vessel is normal and it has a clot that came from somewhere else. So as you'll see in a moment, we've designed systems that are largely designed to physically grab the clot and remove it, not to leave behind a stent, for example. And I'll come back why. So these are so-called large vessel occlusions. We distinguish that from small vessel occlusions. And if you were to highlight over the intracranial circulation right here and blow that up and see where the carotid artery comes up at the base of the brain and divides into two main blood vessels. What's shown here is coming off the proximal part of say the middle cerebral artery, there are a lot of tiny, tiny blood vessels that are going into the deep part of the brain. And these are the so-called perforators. Now they're drawn here so that we can see them, but in fact, if the diameter of this vessel is say three millimeters, 
The diameter of these blood vessels can be 200, 300 microns in diameter. They're tiny. We often don't even see them on angiography, but we know they're there from our histology. But the point is, these blood vessels can be blocked off, not from an embolus that comes from somewhere else, but more akin to coronary disease, progressive atherosclerotic thrombosis of the vessel. And it turns out that the tiny, the occlusion of a tiny, tiny perforator may give you a stroke that's only, say, five millimeters in diameter. But the problem is, is that all the motor fibers that might originate up here have to run right down through this very tight space to get down into the spinal cord. And a tiny, tiny stroke that we call a lacunar stroke uh, can cause fairly profound symptoms, including, you know, plegia on one side of the body. Well, both, are good, both of these stroke subtypes are good candidates for intravenous TPA. But only this type of stroke, where we can actually see an occlusion, is it going to be a target for endovascular therapy. So what we want to know immediately, if a patient's having an acute stroke, do they have a large vessel occlusion that we can target with a, a catheter and endovascular therapy, or do they simply have a small vessel occlusion where we should treat them with TPA, but we don't need to take them to the cath lab? Okay? So that becomes critical in our patient triage. So what I want to talk about is uh, a little bit about some unique characteristics of large vessel occlusions compared to those small vessel perforators and how we currently now have level 1A evidence supporting endovascular treatment. So number one, large vessel occlusions are extraordinarily common. They probably account for up to 40, if not half of all ischemic strokes. And this is changing and still evolves. Dr. Luton mentioned that age is one of the greatest risk factors for stroke. Uh, and we know that atrial fibrillation has a direct linear correlation with age, and as the patient population ages, the, the incidence and prevalence of atrial fibrillation continues to increase. We're likely just to see more and more strokes that are due to large vessel occlusions compared to the small vessel occlusions. So this is an enormously common problem. It's also very severe. Compared to a small vessel stroke, these are very morbid. You have a five time uh, more likelihood of dying in the hospital from your stroke uh, and a threefold reduction in the likelihood of recovering well if you have a large vessel occlusion versus a small vessel occlusion. This may be the most important point I want you to take home as far as the natural history of large vessel occlusions. I'm a big believer in intravenous TPA as a stroke neurologist, but we also need to understand that these large vessel occlusions uh, respond in a fairly modest fashion to intravenous TPA. If they're a candidate for it, I believe we should treat them with TPA. But we should also know that in many cases, it's not likely to work. As an example, we have lots of data that suggests that if you have an acute blockage of the middle cerebral artery and you treat them with intravenous TPA, it's gonna work about 30 to 40% of the time. Meaning the majority of the time, TPA is not going to work to get the vessel open. Okay. If you have enough clot burden that you've plugged up the top of the carotid, what's called the carotid terminus, where the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral arise, TPA works less than 10% of the time. Okay. So yes, we should give it, but no, we shouldn't wait to see if it works. Okay. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So why do some patients respond to TPA and others don't? Well, it's a simple idea, but very powerful, I think. And this is data from a, a paper published from a German group uh, a few years ago in stroke. They asked a very simple question. If we can measure how much clot is sitting in the vessel, does that predict if the patient is going to improve with TPA, yes or no? So they took 138 patients, all of them presenting with an acute blockage in the middle cerebral artery, all of them treated with intravenous TPA, and this was before they were doing any endovascular therapy, and they simply said, can we measure the clot burden? Now this is a non-contrast CT scan. I'm not sure how well this projects, but there's a little bright white line sitting right through there. That's acute thrombus sitting in the middle cerebral artery. It's often called the hyperdense middle cerebral sign. So they simply measured how long is that hyperdense sign, and then they plotted it. Here's the length of the blood clot on the x-axis. On the y is just, did the vessel open with TPA, yes or no? And all of the patients that are represented by the squares, the TPA worked. All of the patients represented by the circle, TPA did not work. So number one, TPA works about 35 to 40% of the time. That's been seen in trial after trial after trial. But then they looked, if the blood clot was four millimeters or less, and Dr. Luton also alluded to this, TPA had a very high probability of working, right? So less than five millimeters long, TPA is likely to work, although there are some patients down here that had very short clots where TPA did not work. But really the telling point is once your blood clot is seven millimeters or greater, TPA never worked. There are no patients here 
okay, where TPA opened the blood vessel. And it sort of makes sense. TPA is going to work, gets carried to the proximal face of the clot, is trying to chew away at the proximal end. Your collaterals that are keeping your brain alive carry blood backwards through the blood vessels, back to the back part of the clot, and it's trying to eat it away from both ends. And if the clot burden is significant, uh, TPA literally runs out of steam. The, the half-life of TPA is actually quite short. Uh, and so this is sort of telling, right? We know with significant clot burning, TPA is not likely to work. So this is sort of the bad news, if you will. They're very common, they're very severe, they respond fairly modestly to TPA, but there is some good news, right? And there's lots of data, even before the trials that, we, that I'm gonna go over, uh, that show that if the blood vessel opens, and that could be either spontaneously with TPA or with some endovascular treatment, that that correlates with the likelihood of a good neurological outcome. It correlates with it, but it doesn't guarantee it. So what I want to know as an interventionalist, if we have a patient with a middle cerebral occlusion right here, and we do some treatment where now we've improved the blood flow in that vessel, and we can be very happy in the cath lab, what we really want to know is how's the patient going to do? That's all we care about, okay? Do we have the patient recover and the next day we get a CAT scan where everything looks great and we're thrilled? Or do we have great technical success, we're really proud of ourselves, and yet despite that, the patient go on, that goes on to have a complete middle cerebral infarct? Or worse yet, do we have really you know, good technical success, we're pleased, and yet we've caused some catastrophic reperfusion hemorrhage because we opened a blood vessel into a lot of brain that was already injured, okay? So two things are important. Yes, you have to get the blood vessel open, but most importantly, you have to choose the right patient to do it in, okay? And those are really the two main problems with some early trials that looked at endovascular therapy. And you guys may be familiar with this, but about three years ago, in February of 2013, there were three papers published in the same issue of the New England Journal that looked at endovascular therapy for these large vessel occlusions compared to TPA. And they were all negative. No benefit of endovascular therapy, and it raised the question of should we or should we not be doing this? Well, what we learned from those trials was two things. One is we weren't selecting patients very well. And in fact, most of the patients enrolled in these trials were being selected on the basis of a non-con CT. They didn't even have a CT angiogram to prove that they had a large vessel occlusion. Some of those patients had a small vessel occlusion. Some of those patients may even have had a seizure and, and not even having a stroke. And over 20% of the patients enrolled in many of these trials didn't even have the disease in question. So number one is we weren't really selecting the right patients. But most importantly, even for the patients that had an occlusion, we didn't have the technology that was good enough really to open the vessels. And Dr. Luton again alluded to this where one, the early devices tested in these trials, well, one was the Mercy Retriever, a little corkscrew device that was meant to engage the clot. The other was an aspiration catheter that was literally hooked up to a little vacuum pump with this little device to try to break up the clot and to suck it out. And it turns out these trials, and this is all that was available when I was a, a fellow uh, about 10 years ago, um, and these devices, it turned out TPA would work 30 to 40% of the time. These devices barely beat that, okay? And so if you can't get the vessel open better than TPA and you're not selecting the right patient, you're not likely to provide any sort of clinical benefit, and that's what those trials showed. So what we learned is, number one, we have to select patients that actually can benefit. And so part of the, the current state of the art is to select patients with a CT angiogram. Some centers do MR angiogram, but, the, but basically CT. And the other, and it's a little beyond the scope of this, but one thing that's very exciting now is the use of imaging to look at whether or not the tissue is still alive. And again, most of you probably know this, a non-con CT is critical uh, to evaluate the acute stroke patient to see if they're a candidate for TPA. That is largely done to exclude hemorrhage, right? Maybe they had an aneurysm, maybe they had something else. Obviously, if they have any hemorrhage, they're not gonna be a candidate for a clot dissolving medication. CT is excellent for that. CT is terrible in the first at least six to eight hours of an acute event, uh, predicting whether or not the brain tissue is still alive. You can have a CT that looks completely normal and actually most of the tissue already be dead because it takes hours for those changes to evolve. Now an MRI scan might be good to tell you better, but MRI is basically pretty impractical at most acute stroke centers. We don't use it at all for the triage of our acute stroke patients. So we'd like a better tool to predict is the tissue still alive? And again, I'll show you some pictures, but we now have so-called perfusion imaging that gives us a better idea of whether or not the tissue's hanging in there and we're likely to improve things if we can just get the vessel open.
Well, if we can choose the right patient, we still have to now get the vessel open safely and quickly, and our early devices weren't doing that. But now, fortunately, we have these so-called stent retriever devices, which have really been a remarkable uh, revolution in how we approach these uh, patients. Uh, and then, quite frankly, you, you have to realize, well, what is required to deliver this care effectively to patients? And, and we are about 25 to 30 years behind cardiology was when they first showed, you know, balloon angioplasty was superior uh, to thrombolytics for STEMI. Uh, and then ultimately, obviously, evolved from balloons to, to bare metal stents to drug-eluting stents to, and so on. We are very early in this, but we do know that you need some, con some comprehensive center that can provide this on a 24-7 basis because like heart attacks, these happen at any time of day and they have to be treated immediately. We can't bring a patient in at two in the morning and treat them at eight. You have to treat them at two in the morning. And there's a, an enormous infrastructure that's required to do this. So we've actually been using this approach with stent retrievers, with perfusion imaging since May of 2012. This is a year before those trials even came out that didn't show benefit with the Mercy device, meaning our community had long switched to a better way of identifying and treating patients even a year before those trials were published. So these are the devices, uh, the so-called stent retriever devices, and they differ from the cardiologist, they look like a stent, right, but they differ from the approach cardiologists use in two main ways. One is these are so-called self-expanding stents, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. They're collapsed in the catheter, and as they're deployed, they have a, a three-dimensional memory. They will actually expand over time as opposed to using a balloon uh, to expand the device. And number two is that they are physically attached to the deployment system. We couldn't detach this if we wanted to, because that's not the goal, to leave it behind. The goal is to use it to engage the clot, to pull it out. And this just shows a video of one of these devices, and you can see it's collapsed in the catheter, and as you unsheath it, it's going to expand. Now, all of these uh, uh, procedures are done from the transfemoral approach. Uh, Again, coming from the femoral artery up the aorta, the first thing that's done, so here's a patient with a left middle cerebral occlusion, there's the clot here. The first thing that's done is a large guide catheter is positioned in the cervical carotid artery. This catheter has a balloon on it that we can inflate to temporary arrest flow, uh, and I'll show you why we would do that. Out of this large guide catheter system, we have a much smaller catheter that's gotta navigate up the uh, intracranial circulation and actually goes through the clot itself over wire, uh, and then this video will show you. So again, normal blood vessel. Here's an embolus, say, from atrial fibrillation. That's blocked the middle cerebral artery, the same location. This is the balloon guide catheter down in the neck, and here's our microcatheter with the microwire. You first have to blindly navigate through the occlusion with the wire. The microcatheter follows. Once you're positioned beyond that, you take the microwire out. You load the stent retriever device into the microcatheter. We're gonna position it across the thrombus uh, and then unsheath the device. And you'll see it's going to expand over time. We usually wait about five minutes. This just shows a cross section to show the idea of it expanding to integrate into the clot. This allows a couple things. One, even before we remove the clot, it tends to allow a perfusion channel uh, to help uh, with the ischemic tolerance of the distal vascular bed. After about five minutes, we're gonna inflate this balloon down in the neck because we're gonna pull this whole clot out and we don't want the blood flow working against us. So we arrest the flow with the balloon, aspirate from the catheter as we are physically pulling the clot out of the circulation. This is done so that we don't have to leave behind the stent. We're very anxious about using aspirin, Plavix, heparin, et cetera, in stroke patients who have um, a, you know, uh, are having an ischemic stroke because of the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Now that approach, using a stent retriever, was the, the basis, and selecting patients with a CT angiogram, was the basis of the five clinical trials that Dr. Luton alluded to earlier that was published in the New England Journal from December 2014 through April of 2015 that really sort of overnight changed the standard of care for acute <coughs> stroke patients. So these are the gold standard studies they're multi-center perspective, all randomized, blinded endpoint trials, treating patients that were eligible for TPA uh, with endovascular treatment within six hours, all of them having a CT angiogram to confirm that there's a large vessel occlusion, all using these modern devices, the stent retrievers, and most importantly, being treated at high volume centers, places that had 
24-7 expertise at managing these patients, not just pulling a clot out, but having the neurocritical care and other expertise to manage these patients before, during, and after the procedure. All of these trials were stopped early by the, each one's data safety monitoring board because there was overwhelming efficacy of endovascular therapy and they thought it was unethical to continue these trials and did not to deny this treatment uh, to potential patients. Now, these are those five trials. They all, of course, have to have fancy names, the number of patients that are enrolled, the number that received intravenous TPA. And this is a measure, the modified Rankin score is a measure of functional outcome of independence at 90 days, which is sort of our gold standard, and all had significant imp uh, impact on clinical outcome with endovascular therapy. And if we have time, we can talk about why there are some differences across these trials, but all of them showed benefit. There are a couple take-home points as well. One is everyone was worried these patients are receiving intravenous TPA and then you're about to do an endovascular surgery on them. What is the safety concern, particularly the risk of causing what's called symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, which is our leading measure of safety of our procedures. So it turns out if you get TPA alone, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage is about three to 7%. Again, that's been shown again, again, and again. There was zero difference in the interventional arm of increased symptomatic hemorrhage with these interventions. So these interventions proved to be very, very safe. The other thing I find very interesting is that uh, most of these trials did not have an upper age limit cut off. Many of our earlier trials did. And so everyone always asked, well, what should you do if you're 85 years old or if you're 90 years old? Should we be treating these patients? These trials defined elderly uh, in two different ways, some trials greater than 70, some trials greater than 80, but what they showed is actually the odds ratio of benefit for the elderly patients was even greater, okay? Because we know if you're 85 years old and your middle cerebral is occluded and you don't recanalize it, the likelihood of you having a good outcome is extraordinarily low. It's a devastating disease. And so providing benefit uh, in, in uh, even a small uh, population of those patients gives a, a, a dramatic sort of increase in the odds ratio. So we are not ageist, for example, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. This is the sort of take-home stat I, I like to give, particularly to, um, uh, to primary care uh, folks who are familiar with cardiology interventions. If you look at the number needed to treat uh, for, for PCI, say for a, for a heart attack, for a STEMI, compared to lytic, uh, just to prevent death, not even to have a good functional outcome, just to prevent mortality, the number needed to treat in different trials is from 22 to 30, it's about 30, okay? The number needed to treat for mechanical thrombectomy for acute stroke, okay, not to ha uh, you know, improve mortality, but to have a good functional outcome, to return to independence is four. Okay. So these are extraordinary numbers. You have to go back to like penicillin for pneumonia to see numbers like this. So these are very, very effective treatments that are having a profound impact on the outcome of our patients. Okay. Now, because of this, and again, the trials were released, the last one in, in April of 2015, the American Heart and American Stroke uh, immediately updated their guidelines for, the endovascular, for, for stroke uh, care in general. Uh, and really highlighted that we have to develop systems of care like the STEMI network and the trauma network to provide this care to as many patients as possible. And that requires a lot of primary stroke centers that can provide intravenous TPA and triage patients when appropriate to centers that are capable of providing this on a 24-7 basis. Uh, and they also were very clear that these trials showed that endovascular therapy requires that these patients go to experienced stroke centers that have a lot of uh, background expertise uh, in doing these. And like I said, we've been doing these procedures at CPMC since May of 2012 and have the largest single hospital experience in Northern California with these devices. So we have a lot of experience doing this. It's a huge team. I can't go through all of this, but I just wanted to at least try to highlight the number of people that I work with. Uh, Dr. Kim is my colleague who's on call as we speak covering our hospital. We have very dedicated nurses, techs that come in at all hours of the night to do this. So I wanna show uh, in the next few minutes two patients uh, that we treated recently. Both of these patients came from Santa Rosa Memorial. Uh, and both of these patients I've spoken to recently uh, and they gave me uh, their permission to use their names, to use their pictures because they wanted their stories told because these are individuals that we're trying to help. And so I'm grateful to them for sharing their story. 
Uh, the first one is pretty unusual. It's a 19-year-old woman. She's a college student here in the area. Uh, and she had congenital heart disease and had two prior surgeries as a young teenager, uh, but had basically been healthy and asymptomatic for four or five years. Uh, but she awoke one morning uh, not too long ago with a right-sided weakness. She was not actually aware of what was going on with her. She didn't really know that she was weak on her right side. Uh, this is a symptom we call neglect. She had some uh, slurred speech and some, some facial weakness. Her roommate, again, you don't expect that your 19-year-old friend is going to wake up having a stroke, but her roommate was very sophisticated and realized that there was, this was clearly a problem and called 911. Uh, she came into Santa Rosa Memorial. She had a stroke scale of about nine, was pretty weak on the, on the left side. She had a CT and a CT angiogram at Santa Rosa Memorial. Uh, the CT scan, fortunately, didn't show any bleeding, didn't show any uh, uh, stroke that was completed. Showed a little bright white dot right here at the top of the carotid on the right. They did a CT angiogram, which confirmed that she had a blood clot sitting here in the right carotid terminus, um, blocking the blood flow into the middle cerebral artery. Now, it turns out, because she was so, a so-called wake-up stroke, she was not a candidate for intravenous TPA because they didn't know when this started. Okay? TPA, in this case, works less than 10% of the time anyway with a clot burden there. So she was transferred to us emergently. When she arrived, she had persistent symptoms. Uh, we do a, a repeat a CT and a CT angiogram to confirm there's a persistent occlusion. We do a CT perfusion study, which I don't think I have images for her to show, but to confirm that we think that the tissue is still viable, that if we can open the blood vessel, we're going to help her. And so we took her to the angiography suite. Again, this is just to show you where the clot is located. This is a high magnification view of the right internal carotid. This is coming up the neck through the skull base. Here's the top of the carotid. There is some blood flow going into the anterior cerebral artery. That's this structure. But there's no blood flow going into the middle cerebral artery, which is this vessel here. This is the, I don't know how well this projects, but this is the stent retriever device that's deployed across the point of the occlusion. This is the thrombus that was removed uh, on the stent device. Uh, this is in millimeters, okay? Uh, and this is the blood vessel uh, before and after. So all of these branches of the middle cerebral artery that are supplied, that are dependent upon the flow through that one little tube right there. Uh, and you know, we actually treated her uh, under anesthesia, and when she, within 30 minutes of waking up, this is her in the ICU. Uh, this, her name's Nora. Um, and she's given the, sort of the victory sign uh, when her left side, and this was within 30 minutes. Her MRI scan the, uh, the same day looked great. She had some ischemic injury in the deep basal ganglia, which is pretty much universal for all patients presenting with a middle cerebral occlusion. That is hard to prevent, but all of her right middle cerebral territory uh, was spared, and she has had an excellent recovery. She, this is Nora here. Um, this is her uh, roommate. Uh, who called 911. Uh, Lee's in the back. Um, it, I still get emotional seeing uh, these guys. Um, so she visited us in CFMC about uh, a few weeks ago. So that's one extreme, a 19-year-old, right, not our everyday stroke patient. This is a more typical stroke patient, right, an elderly person, right. So this uh, very recently treated, also came into Santa Rosa Memorial, and that's not a typo, right? This woman's 92 years old, okay? She has atrial fibrillation, she's on aspirin therapy, uh, and she actually was on her way to some symposium. This woman's a Holocaust survivor and has written a book about her experiences and was on her way to some symposium. She gives talks nonstop about her experience and her life story. So this is a very, very functional, very independent, very sharp 92-year-old. So my bias is there's some 60-year-olds that have the medical health of a 90-year-old we probably shouldn't be treated. And there's some 90-year-olds that are robust that if their quality of life and, and level of functional independence is good, we believe we should offer therapy to. So she developed acute aphasia, so could not speak, could not understand at all. Uh, dense right hemiplegia, right visual field cut, gaze preference, the entire thing had a very large stroke scale of 22. Uh, and came in to, to Santa Rosa, uh, Santa Rosa Memorial, had a CT and a CT angiogram, which showed that she had an occlusion, don't know how, how this projects, of the left middle cerebral artery, exactly what we would think from her symptoms, right? So an occlusion here um, with a pretty devastating uh, large stroke syndrome. 
was within the window of TPA and was treated appropriately with TPA. Again, we know TPA is going to work less than 40% of the time in cases like this. And if you're 90, we know from the early trials that uh, if you have a middle cerebral occlusion with this stroke scale and you're treated with TPA, you have about a less than 10% chance of, ha of having any uh, functional uh, recovery, right? So these are devastating strokes. If you're 92 years old, it's probably less than 5%, okay? So she was transferred emergently to us down at CPMC. We repeated her study, particularly with the CT perfusion. I think I, this is just to give you an idea of the CT perfusion. These two panels basically are a sequence that predict the amount of tissue that are, that's at risk of dying, all the tissue that's dependent upon the blood supply. So everything you see in blue, uh, just on two sections, is all the territory of the left middle cerebral artery, right? We sort of know that because we know the middle cerebral is occluded and we know how bad her stroke scale is. But what we really care about is, is that tissue still alive? If we open this vessel, are we likely to help her? Her CT looks good, but the CT is not good at predicting. And this is what's called the, the blood volume of the same sequences. And again, the simplest thing to do is just to compare side to side, that the blood volume is basically equal. So even in this tissue that's not functioning very well, it appears to have sufficient blood volume to still be alive. But if we don't open this vessel, these collaterals ultimately die out and all this tissue will go on to die. If all of this tissue on the blood volume looked dark blue like this, we would predict that that tissue is likely already irreversibly injured and that to open the blood vessel will not help this patient and could actually cause some uh, significant reperfusion injury. So we are looking at CT perfusion as a way to evaluate and triage these patients. So we thought she was a good candidate given her imaging and her symptoms. This is uh, the, the initial angiogram I did of her left internal carotid artery. This is an AP view sort of staring right through uh, the, the left eye, if you will. This is the carotid coming up the neck, weaving its way through the skull base. This is the carotid on the surface of the brain giving rise to the anterior cerebral vessel here and the middle cerebral, middle cerebral artery here, which is occluded uh, at its origin. Uh, this, again, don't know how well this projects, but the device is deployed across the occlusion. Uh, that is the thrombus that was removed uh, from her. Uh, and this is her, in a single pass, was her vessel uh, after and before. So again, all of these branches that are dependent upon that one single trunk uh, to supply. This is her MRI scan where she did have, again, some ischemic injury in the deep basal ganglia. Again, pretty universal when anybody has a middle cerebral occlusion. Uh, but all of her left middle cerebral territory was spared uh, with little to no ischemic burden. Uh, and this is Lillian uh, Judd here and her son. This is in the hospital immediately after our procedure. Again, I can't see how well this projects. I talked to them yesterday. On, this just happened a couple weeks ago. I talked to her yesterday. She's in acute rehab uh, facility here in the North Bay, and this is her son. Um, and she. Her language has recovered completely. She's walking uh, with physical therapy. Her right hand is still not normal. That's gonna be the, the slowest uh, to recover. Uh, but with her MRI scan and her recovery to date, we think she will do uh, quite well. So those are two real stories of patients uh, treated uh, through Santa Rosa Memorial. But what I'll tell you is that, you know, we've done over uh, 200 of these device uh, treatments in the last few years. The, uh, and this shows the clot we've removed from about 100 of those over time. The clot burden you can see is enormous. Uh, we, I showed you data and Dr. Luton pointed out that you know, if your clot burden is four millimeters or less, and that's four millimeters, TPA has a pretty good chance of working. Once it's greater than seven millimeters, TPA is unlikely to work at all. Uh, and over two thirds of these patients are, are TPA failures, but you can see that the extent of clot that we removed from these patients is uh, enormous. So these are, I've showed you two patients. I'm going to give you some summary data and then I'll be finished. Uh, from May of 2012, uh, January, uh, we performed uh, not quite 300 of these acute stroke treatments with over 220 of them using a stent retriever device. All of them selected with CT angiography and CT perfusion. We are successful in getting the vessel open over 80% of the time. Now, this TICI score, if you're familiar with Timmy from the cardiology world, is just a predictor of how well you're doing. A TICI 3 score means the vessel's open, 100% of the distal vascular bed is open, you have no branch occlusions. 
A tiki tubi means that you've opened the vessel, but you might have lost some fragments. That's still an issue. We're still trying to figure out how to prevent. But as long as over two thirds of the distal branches are open, we call that tiki tubi, and we know that this correlates directly with clinical outcome. And this is the measure of success. Remember, TPA does this less than 40% of the time. We're approaching about 85% of the time now of getting the vessels open. Excuse me. Again, our measure of safety is symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, we see that occurring less than 6% of the time, which is on par with TPA. What we really care about is how are our patients doing at 90 days. Again, functional outcome uh, of functional independence, uh, we're seeing it over 60% of our patients, and that's exactly what was noted uh, in these clinical trials. So we have pretty clear data, it's level 1A evidence that, that these interventions are, show benefit over TPA alone, certainly within six hours. Elderly patients do show benefit, so we, uh, depending upon the functional status of the patient at baseline, uh, evaluate every patient for intervention regardless of age. Uh, we know that high volume centers are gonna be the best suited to treat these patients. There's a lot of discussion now about, well, what about the patient showing up at, six hour, at eight hours, at nine hours? What about the patient that woke up with symptoms and you don't know when they started? Who should we treat and who should we not? Well, for four years, we have used perfusion imaging uh, to offer treatment to patients like Nora, right, who came down. We don't know when her symptoms started, but we thought from a perfusion standpoint, it was, it was worth offering her treatment. Well, this is actually being studied in a randomized fashion now, and we are the only hospital uh, in Northern California and maybe all of the West Coast that uh, is a part of this trial. It's called the DAWN trial, uh, but it's looking at patients that have a proven large vessel occlusion, but their symptom onset is, is late. It's somewhere between six to 24 hours. And we're gonna take these patients, if they have favorable perfusion imaging, are gonna be randomized to either best medical therapy uh, or to endovascular treatment with these stent devices. And so even the patient showing up at your emergency room at 12 hours, right, where people say, well, there's not much that can be done. We have treatments and we have clinical trials to evaluate how best to treat these patients. So we're actively recruiting from all over the Bay Area any patients that have symptoms within six to 24 hours. So these are just some of the trials going on. I just mentioned the DAWN trial. I'll go through these quickly, but basically every patient we treat, we are capturing in some uh, registry uh, data to help promote the research of how best to do this and to identify how, how to help our patients. Uh, and that includes uh, prospective registries, retrospective data of all the patients that I've sort of mentioned, uh, and including evaluating new devices. Where, where cardiology was many decades ago, where they went from balloon to bare metal stent to drug eluting stent is we're going to see over the next decade uh, many different new devices that are that are evaluated. We still, uh, you know, we want to get to 100% revascularization. We're at about 80, 85% now. Maybe we uh, will still get better and better devices uh, to help our, our patients more and more. So it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for inviting me, um, and I'm happy to to take questions if if we have time. Thank you. And doc, Dr. Luton, if there are questions for you as well, I don't know if you do. We have time for questions, or are we moving on? No, you have time. Okay, Dr. Luton. Yes. So that's a great question. So the question is, are we uh, recommending uh, perfusion studies to be done at the outline uh, ER? Actually, we are not. What the American uh, HA and HA guidelines have recently put forth is that it would be reasonable for primary stroke centers that are looking to triage patients to a center that can provide this therapy that they at least have the capacity to do a CT angiogram. Because that, if you do a, have a stroke patient and you do a CT angiogram and it's open, that means the patient's having a small vessel occlusion or they had a seizure, they had some other thing. They don't, they need good care, which you can provide, but they don't need emergent transfer to a center. For a perfusion, since that's just a snapshot in time, even if it looks great here, when they arrive at our facility, we still would have to repeat that to know that the tissue is still viable. So it's an excellent question. But I think non-con CT and CT angiogram, that's what the AHA is currently recommending that primary stroke centers uh, evolve to do and to do rapidly to identify and transfer patients. Yes? 
Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So the question is, if we have a thrombus that we know is less than four millimeters, would you proceed? So obviously we would give them TPA. My bias is to still transfer them to consider treatment. The, the worst and best case scenario is they arrive at our facility and the vessel's open, right? But the problem is on that slide I showed you, there's still patients that have a small thrombus where they did not open. Uh, and the, the AHA guidelines in general, not about clot thrombus, but just in general say, if you give TPA for a large vessel occlusion, you should not wait to see if it works before you try to triage and transfer the patient. You should send them to somewhere where it can be treated. We have patients that arrive where the vessel's open, and right, even if it's two in the morning, I mobilize the whole team, vessel's open, that's a good problem. Um, and yes, it took a, a heroic to transfer the patient, but it still thinks in the patient's best interest. Yes? For those of us who treat uh, uh, strokes and uh, after the events uh, in the community or post acute care, can you talk a little more about uh, targets for high blood pressure management over time uh, as, as a facility? Well, Practically, to some degree, it's the lower the better, as long as they're not lightheaded or dizzy. I mean, that, you know, that's been shown. But we, we try to aim for, you know, 130 over 85 kind of as a general target. I, I try to keep them on the low side, like I said, as long as they're not getting orthostatic or dizzy. I'd rather not wait for and so, so, it goes, so, so after about four days, the brain can handle this a lot better, and it depends on the individual patient, but, but over time, we're trying to continue to perfuse the brain without systemic hypertension. So, so absolutely, really after about four days, four days, you start approaching normal blood pressure targets. And I agree with that completely, and the other thing I would add to that is, certainly for large vessel occlusions, this notion of permissive hypertension was often, well, you, you tried TPA, it didn't really work, you may have a, a persistent occlusion, you need permissive hypertension for those collaterals. If we're in the angio suite and we get the vessel open, we tell our anesthesiologist immediately to lower the blood pressure because most of these patients have gotten TPA. I no longer want their pressure 160. There are no more limitations in flow. I'd rather have their pressure 120. Uh, and so a lot of it now depends on their physiology and what we're able to do uh, in, in the lab, certainly for large vessel occlusion. Right, because the, the point is cerebral perfusion pressure. We're trying to keep the brain perfused. Once the vessels are open, the brain's going to be perfused with systemic pressure so we can lower the systemic pressure safely. For the light-presenting light stroke patients, uh, is the... For the light-presenting stroke patients, is the perfusion scan useful to dis discriminate between whether you're going to go to embolectomy or thrombolysis, or are you just looking at embolectomy at that point? Yeah, so, so the question is for, uh, for the late presenting strokes, and particularly the DAWN trial, uh, is it just for embolectomy, is also for thrombolysis? This is strictly for uh, intervention, for embolectomy. Now, there, and the only folks that are, I know are using TPA beyond three to four and a half hours uh, based on perfusion, those are also part of clinical trials, and there are not many of those that are active now. Uh, but this is triaging patients just for intervention. Uh, from what you said about statin drugs, uh, would anybody with a TIA or a stroke be a candidate for statin drug regardless of the Oh, absolutely. And this, this is, again, both, both the problem and the wonderful benefit of statins is it looks like folks have a, maybe 20% risk reduction regardless of cholesterol. And it looks like possibly these drugs do something to the endothelium to reduce reactivity and reduce inflammation. So it, it may not be the cholesterol numbers that matter. So in general, we prefer them to be treated, ACE inhibitor and statin, and one of the, the you know, trying to reduce the ability of the clots to form, so either the aspirin or the Agronox. drugs other than aspirin increase the risk of stroke? That's a really good question, actually. We have better data on, on cardiac issues, and it looks like uh, there was a study that kind of disturbed me where um, it, it looked like um, naproxen sodium did okay, but, but ibuprofen seemed to increase the myocardial infarction risk, <coughs> likely also may increase stroke risk as well. Um, they don't work for, for anticoagulation or reducing platelet, you know, that, that, that kind of thing, burden of clot. And so we can't use them to reduce the risk of stroke as far as that goes. Um, I generally prefer people, if they're going to be on an NSAID, to be on the proxen sodium due to the more recent data we have. But I, I'm kind of in favor of trying to avoid regular use of any of these type of drugs. Mm -hmm. 
And so the question is, if there is a large thrombus, is it always seen on the CT? Uh, CT angiography has become uh, quite good, very sensitive. Uh, and the other thing I would point out, what I mean by a large vessel occlusion, most of what we treat are the big, big vessels at the base of the brain. But I always say, if you can see it on a CT angiogram, we can get to it with a catheter. So now that we have these data, uh, you know, obviously the main middle cerebral comes up, divides into two, and it divides and continues to divide. Even into some of these more distal branches, if it's supplying the motor cortex, you know, the patient, if they're plegic, even though they have a small occlusion, we believe the risk benefit of offering them treatment is justified. And we've done many treatments now that we're beginning to move further and further out the, the cerebral vascular tree. So CT angiography is very good now in identifying even some of those more distal branch occlusions. It's never going to pick up the small vessel perforator stroke, right? So if you can see it on a CT angiogram, then by definition, it's a large vessel occlusion, and we can potentially treat it. Yes, sir. So the question is, what are the complication rates for intervention, uh, which is critical? I mean, fortunately, the trials have shown that the complication rate uh, doesn't seem to add any uh, significant uh, overall morbidity and mortality to, in, to the treatment of these patients. So in particular, the symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage rate. The main complication rate from a procedural standpoint would be uh, vessel perforation or vessel dissection. So you, if you saw that animation, the first thing we have to do is to navigate the microwire through the point of occlusion into a distal branch. And the animation shows those distal branches and you can see them, right? Well, we can't see them, right? We see the vessel stop. And so all that's by feel, uh, but that is the point where in, you could perforate the vessel while you're trying to blindly navigate the wire through it. Fortunately, in our experience, it happens less than 1% of the time, but it has happened, okay? Um, other complications that would be for any endovascular surgery, you know, groin hematoma requiring surgical repair or a transfusion, for example, uh, the risk of that's extraordinarily low. We've never, we've, again, we've done almost 300 of these. We're putting in very, very large sheaths in patients that have received TPA, uh, but our closure devices are excellent. Uh, we've never had a groin, uh, you know, needing a surgical repair, for example. The, the biggest would be of uh, intracranial hemorrhage, particularly from vessel per perforation. Yes? How successful are you in the first half? Yeah, so uh, really good question. So the question is how often uh, do we achieve uh, full recanalization with one pass of the device? Uh, it turns out that my average number of passes is two, right? So sometimes it comes out on one, sometimes it comes out on two, sometimes you have to do three passes. So again, that's why I think we still have lots of room for improvement of our devices. Uh, the first generation, the Mercy device, didn't really work at all compared to TPA. Now we know these devices, even if they take one, two, three passes, they're still better than TPA alone. But our holy grail is getting to one pass with a single device, getting all the clot out. Um, but it's probably only about 30% of the time does it come out with the first pass. Um, my average is about two. Yes? So I'll comment quickly on the interventional side. So hemorrhagic stroke, excluding epidural and subdural, which would be traumatic sort of bleeding, uh, really falls into two big categories. One is that parenchymal hemorrhage is due to hypertension, and the second would be to uh, hemorrhage due to an underlying vascular lesion like an aneurysm or arterial venous malformation. So we could talk a lot of time about the, the current state of endovascular treatment of aneurysms and AVMs. For parenchymal hemorrhage, uh, hypertensive hemorrhage, there's still not a lot that can be done other than medical treatment, uh, which is largely managing the blood pressure. I will say that at where I am located, our surger, surgery team uh, is about to, uh, to be a site in a clinical trial that's looking at minimally invasive endoscopic evaluation of deep parenchymal hemorrhage. Nothing's ever proven uh, beneficial for these patients, but there's some excitement with using a, a, a small burr hole with a small endoscope into the clot to do minimally invasive clot evacuation to see if that will help patients with that. But the truth is there's nothing proven uh, at this point. Agree? Absolutely. Yeah. One more question. 
Okay, sir. CT engine ramp is a piece of information you would need to decide if there's a large vessel occlusion. We can do that easily at places like San Jose Memorial, mm -hmm. but we have over 16 hospitals referring to us from the region where we may not be able to get those rapidly. Right. So based on symptoms, the severity of the NIA score, would you recommend for going that CT engine ram, which is transferring directly to a tertiary stone side? Yeah, so that's, uh, the question is, if, if it's hard, if it's easy to get the CT angiogram the moment the patient hits the ED, we obviously favor getting the CT angiogram. If it's going to be an outlying facility where they cannot uh, perform it and they need to come to you first before they might come to us, uh, we prefer using clinical symptomatology and the likelihood of having a large vessel occlusion because of the time lost of doing of trying to get the CT angiogram. So as an example, if you have an NIH stroke scale of 10 or greater, you have about an 85% chance of having a large vessel occlusion. That's pretty high. You know, the woman I showed you, she has atrial fibrillation. She has a stroke scale of 20. I don't need a CT angiogram. She has a large vessel occlusion, right? I know it. So we are trying to, you know, we don't have formal guidelines like that yet, but you're exactly right, is that we need not just the CT angiogram, but we need clinical acumen to say, this patient has a very high percentage of a large vessel occlusion. We don't need to go through all of that to get them to where they need to be. And particularly in atrial fibrillation. If they have atrial right. fibrillation, their, their chances go way up. And so, you know, NIH stroke scale, I'd say nine or greater, 10 or greater, and AFib, they need to go. That's right. Peter, you had a question. Um, are all statins the same for TIA patients? I, I recall a study um, five years ago, high dose Lipitor, 80 milligrams a day, with a reduction of 40% compared to controls. Exactly, and I would say we don't know, and that's one of the frustrating things because we have a lot of independent studies, but it's hard to get the head-to-head -head trials. That's why I was so impressed of the aspirin with extended release dipyramidol versus clopidogrel study. It took a lot of guts for a company to agree to that study, and we got very different results than we did out of some of the independent studies. So I don't think we know right now. I agree. Great. Thanks, everybody. That was a great presentation.